Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is David Hunter from Contrarian Macro Advisors. We'll talk about the big picture. Obviously, a lot of waiting and seeing mode as we wait for news from the Fed. Do they continue the dovish comments and policies that we've done? Or do we get more of a hawkish tone, more of an indication of a uh, changes in the near future. Overall, the S&P really chopping around for much of the day, finishing net negative. We'll look at all the key movements and all the key charts. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at the markets through the charts, through the message that technical analysis and the, uh, and the analysis of trends and momentum and breadth and sentiment can provide. I would argue investor, uh, the, the markets themselves are driven by investor psychology. They're driven by the emotional behavior of investors, but also affected by all the other levers that can be pulled that affect uh, that affect investor behavior. Things like the Fed and expectations for the Fed, earnings, all of these things, uh, news flow, just all of these things that are part of the mosaic that investors are faced with as they make their buy and sell decisions. So what we can do is use charts to cut through that noise and focus on the message of the markets themselves. What are the trends telling us about investor excitement and euphoria and desperation and panic? Arguably, the charts can tell us about uh, all that and more. This week so far has been about a choppy environment. It's been about wait and see mode as the S&P continues to threaten new all-time highs. I think the early tick of the day probably uh, took us a, a couple clicks above where we were yesterday, but overall finishing a little weaker through the course of the day. We'll get to the chart of the S&P here in a little bit. I did want to point out our guests coming up uh, this week. So today we actually have David Hunter from Contrarian Macro Advisors. Excited to welcome Dave to the show uh, for the first time today. Tomorrow on Wednesday the 16th, we have Chris Shavaco from Shavaco Capital in Atlanta. On Thursday, we have Leslie Juflas from uh, Trading Live Online here in the Seattle area. Then just a heads up this Friday, we're actually going to take off for the Juneteenth holiday. Stock Charts is taking that as a company holiday and uh, in line we will take the day off from uh, from the final bar, but we'll certainly be following the charts. We'll be back with you live on Monday to update on the latest patterns and trends. Wanted to start our market recap with a poll. We have a poll going at all times on our live stream uh, running on stockcharts.com. Uh, we also have it through social media on our YouTube channel, on Twitter and elsewhere. Uh, so look for the poll anytime you can. We asked you today, or in the last couple of days, you decide you're bullish, then you start looking for evidence to support your thesis. Which behavioral bias are you demonstrating? The correct answer, confirmation bias. This is where you decide you are bullish. You decide you have a particular point of view. Then you start digging for evidence to support that uh, claim that's called confirmation bias, because what you're basically doing is looking to confirm your preconceived uh, notions. Endowment bias is a related, but it's a little different. That's actually where you um, you know, are, are thinking of your portfolio, thinking of your holdings a little different than the rest of your, uh, than the rest of the, the stocks out there. You attribute different, uh, you know, you attribute different uh, evidence or different weight to, uh, to stocks that you own versus the ones you doesn't, you, the ones you don't. Uh, and as a result, you have an emotional attachment to, uh, to those stocks that you hold and you trade them differently as a result. Bullish bias and bad idea bias were completely made up by yours truly. So the correct answer was, confirmation bias, something that I think is uh, is running rampant at times in the markets and something to, to uh, try to avoid. Let's continue on with our, uh, with our market recap. As we look at the S&P choppy today, so sort of fluctuating around uh, the level that was achieved about 30 minutes after the open, we sort of opened high, came off, and this was after an acceleration to the upside yesterday. We really finished in a position of strength. And I think the character of the market yesterday uh, by the end of the day certainly changed in terms of the overall feel of it. Uh, but in general, it was sort of a uh, quite a choppy environment uh, after that. We settled in around 42.46, 42.47, which is about a quarter percent 
below where we closed uh, yesterday after the acceleration to the upside. The NASDAQ composite actually uh, down about 0.7%, similar for the NASDAQ 100. This is after you know, reaching that key 14,000 level. That's where the NASDAQ 100, the NDX, has found resistance a number of times previously. So it'd be very interesting to see if there's enough gas left in the tank to uh, to push higher, certainly could uh, be, you know, if you're looking for a catalyst for the growth trade to continue to work, certainly could get it uh, yesterday. Also could get a huge headwind if there uh, is language that implies the uh, the Fed's starting to ease off on their very accommodative uh, tone that they've uh, that they've struck so far this year. The S and P 100, by the way, also down about 0.3 percent. Small caps, one of the only major indexes that we follow that were up. Also, the TSX uh, up in Canada, uh, positive, but not by much. Less uh, less than half a percent in the positive uh, positive side. Ten year yields essentially uh, chopping around and uh, settling for the most part right around one and a half uh, percent, which is that key line in the sand that we've talked about. They came up a lot. Uh, yesterday and sort of settling in today. I think tomorrow we most likely get a move there depending on uh, the reaction to the uh, Fed and the dollar essentially flat using the UUP as a proxy for the dollar index. Precious metals down, gold down, the only commodity really up. Uh, the USO is up 1.4%. So that uh, certainly helped to uh, push energy stocks uh, higher. Uh, they were it was sort of energy and everything else today, uh, energy up and most other things are down, although industrials, utilities, financials finished uh, above the zero line, but a lot of sectors really weighing more heavily, especially tech and communication services, which are some of the leadership from uh, from yesterday. Cryptocurrencies overall rotating lower, and a lot of that's just happened in the last hour or two. Um, sort of this rollover. Bitcoin had been up around forty one two fifty, now actually dipping back below forty thousand. Uh, just uh, just recently, I haven't seen any headlines or anything to to drive that. I'm just looking at the charts and seeing a fairly significant uh, turn lower. That might be something we can fill in. Uh, through the course of the evening. Let's continue looking at a chart of the S&P 500, talk about the big picture. You know, I was doing a webcast earlier and talking about Fibonacci retracements and talked about how Fibonacci retracements fit into an investment process, a holistic investment process, right? It's not about just one technique or one indicator or one chart. It's about a series of charts and how they all fit together in a different uh, relationship. And, and so when I'm looking at a chart of the S&P, I think one of the most important things, I would say two things that I'm paying attention to in terms of tracking this trend and really the persistence of this uptrend. We've had a series of pullbacks that have been sort of in the four to 6% range, most recently back here in early May, where we pulled back about 4.6% from the peak in early May to uh, the second week in May before continuing on uh, and uh, resolving back to the upside and coming to, to new all-time highs again this week. You can see the trend line taking the October low and the March low. You can see that lines up very well with the lows we saw in May. And that's about a little bit below where we're at right now, currently just around 4,200 or so for that for that trend line, which means during any sort of pullback, that's the first line in the sand that I would be gravitating towards to see if it's able to hold. Just below there right now is the 50-day moving average, which is currently around 41.75. So those hold on a pullback, then you have a very standard uh, garden variety, plain vanilla pullback. A lot, you know, similar to many of the pullbacks that we've had in the last month, uh, six months. Clearly, there's this pattern where the S&P pushes to new highs, sort of has a bit of a, of a pullback, a digestion move, or it digests recent gains, about 4 to 6%, and then is resolved higher. At some point, assuming that that pattern is going to break, and the question is, how is that going to happen? Well, first things first, you have to focus on a line in the sand that holds or where it doesn't. And for me, it's the trend line support and the 50-day moving average, currently around 41.75% to 4,200. Looking at a chart of the S&P, if we would break those, I would immediately probably turn a little more cautious and we would be looking back at the lows uh, in uh, in mid-May, around 4050. And I think breaking that would finally really change the character of this chart, make it from a, an uptrend of higher highs and higher lows to more of a downtrend, making a new uh, lower low. And I think that would be uh, differently uh, a, a change of character. Overall, though, we have not had it. This has been a fairly orderly trend with fairly orderly uh, movements. I was asked recently about uh, the market trend model, which we update every Friday. So it doesn't really update until the uh, the weekly close on Friday. I updated it again last Friday. The medium term trend following model that I use, which is essentially looking at the weekly MACD or the weekly PPO, has been negative for about four weeks now. And what that tells me overall, uh, again, based on the question I got, it's it's less about you know how do I is there a system that I trade by based on that? Not really. It's more of a risk on versus risk off measure when that is negative. When it's bearish, it just tells me to be more cautious than opportunistic, to think more about risk management and less about opportunity. Not to, you know, telling you to blindly sell things just because it's it's about focusing on the trend and focusing on 
lines in the sand. So while that model has turned negative, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of charts like uh, home builders. I'm thinking of charts like John Deere that have had really good runs that are now starting to roll over. And at some point, uh, a chart that has been looking good, the higher highs and higher lows starts to look less good and it's making lower lows and lower highs. And when I'm looking at the chart of Deere, I'm looking for um, you know, lines that are broken. I'm looking for support levels that have been broken, the 50 day moving average that have been broken. And at this point, it feels more like the path of least resistance is down until we start to show signs of accumulation. Uh, the RSI is now more in bearish mode. You're looking for some sort of sign that buyers are entering in and buying in on the weakness. And a couple of things would tell you that we find support at an expected level, we uh, make a higher low, uh, which would tell us that, uh, that all of a sudden the selling pressure is potentially dissipated and you're seeing demand increase and you're seeing uh, buying interest uh, build up. But I think on a lot of sectors like that, financials as well, you're seeing more relative weakness. And it's all about uh, you know understanding that at some point you need to lighten up those sorts of uh, positions and focus on, on opportunities that are uh, continuing to work to the upside. Having said that, when we look at what's working to the upside, energy certainly uh, getting a bid today. If you look at the top 10 um, stocks just on price return, it's a lot of uh, stocks in the, uh, in the energy sector, Marathon, Diamondback, um, Occidental, ExxonMobil, all within the top 10, Halliburton. Uh, and if you look at stocks that have improved based on their uh, scooter rankings, stocks that are gaining the most in their scooter rankings, things like Chevron and Halliburton uh, all appearing on there. So a bit of a, a bid higher for the energy sector. This has obviously been a bit of distribution mode. It'd be interesting to see if you see some of those stocks continue to regain footing. And I'm seeing energy uh, sort of bubble up to the top of the Schooner Report, certainly a theme to pay attention to. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with David Hunter from Contrarian Macro Advisor. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so, so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. We're going to do another mailbag segment a little later in today's show, and we would love to answer one of your questions next time we do it on Friday's show. As a reminder, you can email us any questions that come up as you are analyzing your own charts, trying to answer questions for your portfolio. Let us help you along the way. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We have a YouTube channel called Stock Charts. Just check it out. Put a comment below the video that you're watching. We'd love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment. Also, as a reminder, the new Stock Charts TV on demand is really well done. It really illuminates some of the great content that we put out on this show, but on the, on the other shows on Stock Charts TV, including some of our wonderful guests like David Hunter joining me here in a minute. Go to StockChartsTV.com. Use your email to set up a free account. We're also on all the app stores. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, David Hunter. David's the chief macro strategist at Contrarian Macro Advisors, uh, based in the uh, New England, uh, based in New Hampshire. Uh, we were talking before the show and, and discovered, I discovered at least, we had a, a, a similar a company in our past. We both were a part of Fidelity at some point in our, uh, in our history. David, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you on today for the first time. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. So it's a pleasure to catch up with you. I'm really excited to hear your take. Obviously, we're, you know, the market's sort of in wait and see mode, right? We've had sort of lighter volume, sort of a choppy environment, but overall the S&P continues to push higher. When you're looking at the markets, when you're looking at the S&P 500, what stands out to you? Yeah, I'm pretty constructive on the market here. And I am a contrarian and I get a lot of pushback on Twitter because people say, look where we are in the market. And you're, I'm probably the biggest bull on the street right now. Uh, I'm looking for 17,000 on the NASDAQ this summer, um, 4,700 minimum on the S&P, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's 5,000. Um, so I, I, you know, it doesn't sound very contrary when we're up at the highs, but I look at sentiment a little differently and I say it's, you know, it's a bit of a nuance, but in spite of, you know, put call ratios and, and sentiment indicators showing a lot of bullishness, I also sense an awful lot of people looking for a top here and what i say is you know they have one one foot out the door 
you know, mm. looking for the point at which they're going to sell. So I, I actually think what we're seeing here is normal volatility around the Fed meeting. I don't expect anything big to come out of this meeting that's going to change anything. Um, you know, we may see that in a few months, but I don't think it's this meeting. And my sense is we're going higher. Um, it's it's and, and it's funny. I, I know when we would have uh, at, uh, at Fidelity, we would have uh, strategists in, and we'd ask them. We'd always try to ask what you know. What what are your contrary calls? What do you, what are you uh, your out of consensus views? And I I can definitely agree with you based on the conversations I've had. You know, being wildly bullish here and and expecting the upside that you uh, that you are is certainly out of. Uh, I mean, that's that's out of mainstream. I mean, most people are are expecting some sort of. Uh, some sort of corrective pattern. What what is it, if I could ask, that you think propels us? What what allows us to do it? Is it the reemergence of the growth trade, things like the Fang stocks that are starting to work again, or pullbacks in financials and industrials, other cyclicals re you know sort of re up their game and push us to new highs? What where's the leadership come from? Do you think? Yeah, I think I think the leadership's actually surprisingly going to be tech and some of the other growth areas. I back when. Um, the 10 year was at 175, called a 120 10 year, and that's still my call. I think we see that in the next month or two. So that's helping to propel the NASDAQ and the tech stocks back into leadership, uh, kind of quietly so far. But I think as we go through the summer, you're going to see the fangs, the semiconductors, and some of the other um, techs that have been hit pretty hard really pick up uh, momentum again. And what I say, I think we're moving into a 39 year secular top. A bull market that started in August of 82 with the beginnings of disinflation. I think we are going to see a top this year, probably by the end of the summer. So this is kind of a last, what I call a parabolic melt-up, last hurrah. And since tech's what got us here, I think tech leads right into the top. But surprisingly, what I'm seeing in some of the, the moves in the charts is um, that that what we've seen in you know, the materials and the industrials um, and things like home builders, they're coming down to levels where I think they are ready to turn back up. They had a very short pullback, as you mentioned, and I'm not seeing them as the beginning of big corrections. I think, I think you're going to see a pretty broad rally this summer with tech leading, but certainly some of the other value, cyclical value areas uh, carrying some of the load. Um, the areas that I'd be more nervous about would be financials because rates are coming down for at least a period here, um, you know, in some of the defensive areas. It, it's such a fascinating take, David. And when I think we only have a, about a minute left, but I totally hear what you're saying with some of the pullbacks in stocks like Lenar, some of the home builders, right? They've, it, you know, all else being equal in a vacuum, they feel like they're sort of actionable pullbacks sort of the buy on the dips opportunity if the if the trend persists if i could ask just a, one final question then you know if we do continue higher as you're expecting we push in toward the fall what, what sort of things would you be looking for to actually define the top what would tell you that things are in place is it a change in sentiment is it a breakdown of key levels that you would be focusing on is it a change in leadership rotation in leadership what give us an idea of what you'd be looking for to sort of identify this is the top you need to get defensive yeah, one, one of the things certainly will be, if I'm right about a parabolic, as this thing goes very vertical, you know, if you if you truly do see the NASDAQ up to that level by the end of the summer, um, those are things that can't you can't stay vertical for very long. So that's certainly the first thing. From a catalyst standpoint, I think it's going to be Fed tightening. So in, as much as I think we have a respite here in rates, I'm calling for a 2.5% 10-year during the latter part of this year, you know, the last uh, three or four months of the year, as the Fed is forced to tighten into, a, and, yeah, I don't think this is transitory inflation, or it's certainly not going to be looking like transitory inflation, mm. you know, come fall. I think we're going to have another leg up in a lot of these materials, and I think the Fed's going to be forced to tighten, um, and the market's certainly going to push rates up as well. So, so I think that is as as that begins to happen, I think you're going to start seeing you know, the, the fall off in the momentum and a lot of those things that were driven up as rates came down. So, so the fangs, you know, I think, you know, the fangs look great here. They've spent the last, most of this year in, in a high level consolidation after a big run last year there, I think they have a big leg up here. You know, I can't name names, but the biggest one is the one I think, you know, has, looks great. Um, and um, those, 
I think you'll start seeing, you know, the either they're up on stilts or the momentum starting to slow. Those are things that I'd look for, but it's very much, I think the catalyst for the rollover into a bear market is gonna be Fed tightening. That's a great take, David. Listen, it's so good to have you on the show. I'm, I am I so enjoy getting to know you and your work a little bit more. I look forward to hopefully having you on again soon. I know you're on Twitter at Dave H Contrarian. So I'd encourage people to uh, check you out there. David Hunter from uh, Contrarian Macro Advisors. Thanks so much for coming on today. Uh, okay, thanks very much, Dave. You take care. You as well. That's David Hunter from Contrarian Macro Advisors coming to us from uh, New England. We had I, I wish we had an hour to talk before the show. We were comparing notes. Uh, he's uh, been in the Boston area and I uh, used to live there. So we're having a great time talking about some market history. It turns out we had both spent some time in the Fidelity chart room, which, uh, which I really appreciate. You know, it's interesting talking about a contrary, contrary point of view, having a melt up and having the NASDAQ uh, go up to 17,000 and then a long-term top is not a theme I've heard a lot. And I, I, it makes sense. I and mean, when we talk about how that could happen, I, I feel like a lot of times with, as long-term investors, you want to think about the narrative, think about how something could play out, what sort of uh, guideposts, what sort of signals along the way would confirm for you whether or not that's actually playing out uh, or not. And I, I really appreciate that scenario that, uh, that Dave was able to uh, articulate there. Let's continue on with the final bar mailbag, uh, answering your questions that you've sent in. As a reminder, you can email us questions at any time. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. Let's continue on and uh, hit some of the questions that we've heard in recent days. Question one, okay, so if interest rates continue to come down, that is a quote, a return to growth stocks. But David, if interest rates come down, does that not also herald a weaker economy? Surely, surely the market can't have it both ways, although it has pretty much had it every way since uh, April 2020. Um, and it's a really good question. So, I, you know, and again, I would always caution you when I start talking about interest rates do this, so stocks do this, uh, interest rates do this, banks do this. Um, you know, I, I, I immediately go back to uh, conversations with Bob Prechter, presentations that he've get, he's given where he cautions you immediately at drawing simple relationships. It is very difficult to have a persistent relationship between any two assets, to be honest with you. There will be periods when correlations are a certain way, but most things, if not everything, tends to be uh, relatively fluid. Uh, if you tell me that stocks go up and gold goes down, I can show you plenty of examples where the complete opposite happens. So, you know, based on your question, I worked up this chart before the show just to illustrate your point. You know, right? It is is uh, you know higher rates would mean healthier economy and things are going well. Uh, rates come down, wouldn't that mean a weaker economy? But I'd point out, you know, half of the last decade where the you know the S and P going high or arguably economy in fine shape and rates basically going down the whole time. So there are periods where that relationship makes sense. There are other periods where it doesn't. And I, and I would argue that, you know, it's because these are not happening in a vacuum. There's a lot of different things and, you know, rates going up or down can mean a lot of different things. Uh, I would tell you that, you know, one of the, the challenges, I think going back to David uh, Hunter's comments, uh, you know, it's about what the Fed, when the Fed needs to step in and, and this idea of transitory inflation, the inflation that, you know, the spike in inflation is just a temporary phenomenon is what they're what they're suggesting here. Um, if the market starts to think that that's not the case, then I think we'll see a very different reaction to things than we have uh, so far. So far, it's assuming that the Fed is very, very supportive. And as a result, we've now seen uh, rates remain relatively uh, stable. The market continue to go higher. That can change dramatically. Again, I don't. I agree with David. I don't, I don't know if we're going to get any big surprises tomorrow uh, from the Fed, but but certainly through the course of this year, I think there could be uh, some news that's going to change that. Next question about support and resistance levels. When you draw your support and resistance levels, do you focus on the last higher high, higher low, or lower low, lower high of the last impulse wave? And or if it is uncharted territory, you go back in time as far as you need it until the price structures on the left side of your charts. What's your focus on drawing support and resistance levels? Yeah, so in general, when I'm drawing support and resistance, I always tell people to start at the final bar, start at the current bar here on the right, start at the right and look to the left. And, and when you run into the price, that's when you start looking around at what levels you're at. So when I'm looking at something like the New York FANG plus index, pretty clear because you have levels of resistance and levels of support because it's been relatively range bound. And so you have clear delineations of where, you know, the market has topped and where the market has uh, has bottomed. You know, the challenge when you're looking at the chart of the S&P is you're basically at all time highs. A lot of stocks, Facebook and others, you're at all time highs. So what do you do then? I think that's where uh, traditional support and resistance is a little less helpful. 
So people do one of two things. Number one, they rely more on projections. So just like you have Fibonacci retracements, you can do what's called a Fibonacci extension or Fibonacci projection or some sort of elegant wave pattern where you're projecting a pattern in the future. I'm not a big fan of those um, because the people I have worked for in my career, long-term money managers are more in camp number two or uh, a B where uh, it's basically you turned into trend following mode. And when the market's at all time highs, you wouldn't sell that for any reason until the uptrend is exhausted because it's working for you and it's helping you outperform, never stop that until uh, it stops going higher. And so I have sort of learned in my career to switch into trend following mode and look at things like trend lines and moving averages, which is why in the S&P, I'm not projecting as much an objective and more just following the trend. And as long as that continues on, I think we're uh, in good shape. So that's what I would do. Start the current bar and look to the left, see what you run into. When you run into the price, that's the, uh, that's the moment. Next question, uh, the inflation protected, and we only have time for one more question, the inflation protected tip bond ETF is rarely mentioned on stock chart shows or on the platform. For example, it's not in any predefined RRG group or on the dashboards market overview. Tips have been outperforming uh, IEF and TLT, which are some of the uh, bond ETFs that uh, I know I refer to and others do as well. If you have to be in bonds during the current inflationary period, it looks like the logical uh, choice. It's a totally fair point. Um, you know, why do we not refer to the Inflation index bonds more. That's a really good question. I, to be honest, I don't find myself referring to bonds that often. I keep it really basic and look at uh, the TLT and maybe the AG, and then I look at the ten-year yield and 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 now the shape of the yield curve. We've talked about more because I think it's at a key point. I don't really dig into anything more than that. I would say that if you are running a portfolio and you're thinking of a fixed income a asset allocation and you're thinking of where you want to be, absolutely, I think there are a lot of opportunities looking at. Treasury bonds, looking at high yield, looking at um, uh, you know corporate bonds, looking at um, uh, you know inflation index bonds. There are a lot of different things you can do. For me, when I'm looking at the chart of the TIP TIP, you know, for me, I'm I'm thinking of momentum and I'm thinking of the returns on the TIP fund versus other funds. And the fact that it's been underperforming stocks so long, when I think of ranking anything based on uh, based on their trend, anything related to fixed income is pretty far down the list right now. So that's probably why I don't. I, I would tell you it may be an interesting signal when you hear me starting to talk about the tip uh, ETF, that might be a signal that inflation is really starting to manifest. Uh, but overall, you're absolutely right. When you're thinking of a fixed income allocation, the idea of something like tips and tip TIP is just one of the many ETFs you can look at. This is the iShares version of it. But there are many others, totally a legitimate uh, way to think about it. It's a good question on why we don't incorporate in some of the other parts of the uh, website. I've made a note and I'll, I'll certainly check that out. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. We're going to start with Bitcoin. We haven't talked about it uh, in a little bit. I just want to mention we're now at the upper end of this range. You know, I published a video on my YouTube channel not too long ago. My the channel is called Market Misbehavior. And we talked about this range, sort of the upper end of the blue shaded area, the pink shaded area in the bottom. This was based on Fibonacci retracements, but also on just support and resistance levels. You can see we bounced off of Fibonacci support a number of times here in the last month. That also lined up with the lows from January uh, before the uh, before Bitcoin bounced off of 300 to double, to uh, over double up into the 60s. We're now at the upper end of the range and nearing the 200 day moving average from below. So from my perspective, we're at the upper end of this range. And the question is, do we find resistance as we have previously and rotate back to remain in the range or do we break out above there? And I'd certainly be looking at the 200 day uh, through the remainder of this week certainly can come into play at any moment given the volatility in cryptocurrencies. Chart number two is FANG when I'm looking at what's working today. Energy and looking at a chart of FANG, which is Diamondback Energy, I'm seeing a lot of nice movements. FANG was up 5% today, uh, but a nice rotation higher on oil prices uh, going up. This is sort of a nice, consistent uptrend. It's had some pullbacks to the 50-day moving average, now resolving potentially to the upside, making a new closing high uh, for the year. I think that's a space to continue to watch if we do see a, an emergence or a reemergence of leadership from energy. Finally, home builders. I was interested, David Hunter mentioned uh, home builders and others at uh, potential uh, buy points. And I, I totally get the argument. Uh, strong long-term trends that are weak in the short term for the last month are a pretty classic uh, buyable opportunity. And that could be the case for uh, home builders. I would love to see a higher low of some sort indication, indicating some sort of buying uh, entering into the market. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Special thank you to David Hunter from Contrarian Macro Advisors sharing his thoughts. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.